Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Thomas Sir. I'm the Executive Vice President of the not for profit Catalis Institute, the organizer of today's webinar. Uh, it's called Why and How Can Exercise Slow the Aging Process, Evolutionary and Molecular Perspectives. Well, we plan to have today's two featured speakers uh, on this topic at our virtual Metabesity conference this past October, but the pandemic got in the way of a full session. But today we have a dedicated expanded session uh, and I've been waiting uh, with great anticipation for the last four months now. Our speakers today are Dan Lieberman, Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard. Dan is a prominent paleoanthropologist who studies how and why the human body is the way it is, with a primary focus on the evolution of physical activity. His newest book, Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding, is actually the subject of a giveaway that uh, will be announced a little bit later uh, this morning. Uh, our other speaker, Tom Rando, is the director of the Glenn Laboratories for the Biology of Aging at Stanford. He's a leading authority on aging. Uh, his research focuses primarily on tissue-specific stem cells in aging and disease, and on the pathogenetic me mechanisms in gene therapy for muscular dystrophies. Our moderator will be Joan Manick, Head of Research and Development for, at Life Biosciences there in Boston. You can see her background there. She's formerly co-founder and chief medical officer of Restore Bio. Joan is an authority in the development of drugs targeting aging pathways uh, to treat and prevent age-related diseases. So a couple of housekeeping points before we begin. First, we are muting folks to preserve the sound quality. If you know that, notice that you're off it, please be attentive. Keep, keep on mute to optimize the sound quality for all. Second, uh, the session will proceed in three parts. First, Dan and Tom will present some slides and opening remarks. Then Joan will moderate an intra-panel discussion in a sort of a fireside chat with Dan and Tom. And the third part will be audience Q&A. Please type any questions you may have in the chat box and the panelists will try to get to as many as they can. Um, I think there's a hard stop for Dan. He's the subject of an experiment back at his ha Harvard lab. So he may have to leave toward 11.15. So if you have questions for uh, Dan, maybe prioritize that uh, earlier in the proceedings. Third, we are recording this webinar, a YouTube video of the panel presentation of the Q&A, uh, and a PDF version of at least some of the slides will be posted to our Catalyst website within a couple of business days. Uh, and all registrants will receive links uh, when, when this is available. Um, we'll start the session in a moment, but I want to introduce Adrian Berg, the executive director of our not-for-profit uh, Catalyst Institute, which was set up last year to start taking on the responsibility of our Metabesity conferences and webinars like this one today. Adrian? Thank you. So the Catalyst Institute, if you don't know it, is what I call the little engine that could. Uh, we are here for the prevention and delay of age-related diseases. But the way we do that is very unique. It's through collaboration, breaking silos, bringing all the stakeholders that have to do with health span, healthy longevity together. One way is through the conference that we just heard. Um, and we had over a thousand people virtually. We were able to really spin on a pin and have, I think, the best gala of any virtual conference uh, last year in October. So block the date. We're doing it again. And we may be doing it hybrid as well in Washington, D.C. And that will be October 11th through 14th. So I could assure you that you're going to get invitations on that one. Uh, but think about it because it was wonderful, very silo breaking, but we went a little further. We also have created an online virtual campus. It has a library with regard to prevention of disease of aging, geroscience, social science, behavioral science, but more importantly to me, ways for all of you to collaborate through forums, special interest groups, and we're beta testing it now, and we're launching it in a month. And that will be the virtual campus. And you'll learn all about this at catalyst.org. Catalyst.org, and of course, you're gonna get emails with regard to that, so you don't have to know even how to spell it. But the third thing we're doing today that I wanted to tell you about was we are having a contest. And if you, you heard Thomas talk about Dr. Lieberman's book, Exercised, which is a great book, you can read it and you can lift it. So you can actually do your exercise at the same time as you're learning about exercise. Very good. Uh, and we have to give a shout out to uh, the Chico Clark of Penguin Random House because three books will go to the lucky winners. How do you enter the contest? Very simple. At the end, uh, if you simply put in the chat room one line 
few words about how you exercise or your barrier to exercise or how you overcame a barrier to exercise. We're going to anonymously, you won't be mentioned, put that into an article that we also promote on our wonderful social media. And we'll take a drawing and we will actually mail you the physical book, not a download. So this is a, a great opportunity for you to search your soul and see how you're exercised. With that, on with the show. Excellent. So thank you so much, Adrian. It's Joan Manick, I'll be moderating. And just as some background, I often get asked by people, what is the best intervention for stopping aging? And I always say in humans, the best validated intervention is exercise. And we couldn't have two better speakers talking to us about the benefits of exercise, both from an evolutionary perspective, as well as from a basic science perspective. So to start, I'm delighted to introduce Dan Lieberman, who will talk about the benefits of exercise from an evolutionary, evolutionary perspective. So Dan, you want to share your screen? Sure. Thanks, Joe. Nice to, nice to see everybody. Let me uh, share my screen in the classic Zoom fashion here. And hopefully this is working. Is this, is this looking good? That looks great. Good. All right. So uh, I'm delighted to be here, and um, um, there are some benefits to the to this kind of virtual Zoom world, and that is that we can have events like this that actually um, are kind of broader and more general and reach more people sometimes than you can fit in a room. So that's nice. Um, and I'm delighted also to talk about um, a subject that I think we're all very passionate about, which is the importance of exercise for um, for for helping people age better. And um, but what so what I'm going to try to do uh, since it's um, uh, since it's really my day job actually, is to try to give you an evolutionary perspective on why that's the case. Because we often talk about how exercise is helpful, right? And all the various little mechanisms, you know, in terms of how exercise affects cholesterol levels and mitochondrial function and so on. But, but very rarely, if ever, do we really talk about why exercise is so beneficial. And I'm gonna give you some ideas um, and some hypotheses about, about that sort of evolutionary origin, which I think is pretty important. Okay, so to get started, I should mention I have no disclosures other than maybe I should disclose my new book, which you just heard about um, on this topic. And I never know quite what, um, what exactly, uh, whether or not I should disclose something like that, but there we are. This, at least it's a pretense to, uh, to hawk the book as well. And I hope that those of you who uh, read it enjoy it. Okay, and, and um, I also like to do my acknowledgements before I get started, because otherwise things are kind of rushed at the end of a lecture, but there's a lot of folks who I've worked with over the years, who've uh, contributed in various ways to the research that I'm gonna talk about today, um, including various funding organizations, and I wanna thank them all as well. So um, there are too many to name in person, but you know, nothing is ever done by oneself. There's always a large team and group of people, not to mention the folks that we've worked with uh, in the field, um, and they've also been very helpful. Okay, so, so what I study is essentially how and why the human body is the way it is. And I combine um, research in the field. So I do have a field site in Kenya where uh, we've been working in the same uh, village essentially for about 12 years now, uh, but I've been working in Kenya for much, much, much longer for many decades. Um, I also do comparative anatomy and paleontology. I've done lots of field work, uh, you know, finding fossils and studying them and all that sort of stuff and looking at the sort of evolution of the human body. And then finally here in my lab, which is just right behind the wall uh, behind me, uh, we do experimental biomechanics and physiology. So we kind of study how people use their bodies in, in the real world, i.e. not just the Western world and you know, college students, but we also go out and take our lab out into the field, but we also do um, experimental work right here in the lab as well. But I'm not gonna talk today about any of the experimental biomechanics and physiology, but a lot of our work is on the, is on the biomechanics and physiology of running, and, but we also study you know, other topics as well because I'm really interested in the ev evolution of physical activity. And most of my work has been on the evolution of running and walking, um, but we've also worked on throwing and sweating and carrying and sitting and breathing and chewing and swallowing, all kinds of other activities. We're also actually doing some work on swimming these days, actually. And, um, and all of this has kind of got me interested in what I call the exercise paradox, which is that, um, I mean, everybody knows that we evolved to be physically active and, and everybody knows that exercise is good for you. You don't need a PhD or an MD. Uh, you know, to, to, to realize that. And yet, if you think about the very basic requ um, um, minimum recommendations by the World Health Organization, the American Heart Association, the Surgeon General, the American 
College of Sports Medicine, every major organization you can think of on the planet suggests that people get a minimum of 150 minutes a week of physical, of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And yet, according to the CDC, less than 20% of Americans actually manage to do that. And uh, approximately 50% of Americans, uh, according to surveys, claim that they don't actually even exercise, you know, you know get on a treadmill or do some kind of uh, physical activity for the sake of health and fitness. So, so we've got a bit of a problem, right? And, um, and yet, uh, so one of the questions is why is that the case? Why do so few people exercise? But also, uh, why is exercise so, so helpful? And so the mantra that we use regularly in my field is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Although I've got a picture of Darwin here, that was actually a phrase uh, written by uh, the great famous geneticist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who wrote that actually in an essay for, for high school teachers. But, but what he meant was that, whereas many branches of biology explain how things work, you know, how, for example, we're gonna learn from Tom about how, <clears throat> how stem cells, for example, uh, in muscle respond to, 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 to physical activity, uh, why they work the way they do requires an evolutionary explanation because because we weren't designed, we weren't engineered, we evolved. And so if you wanna understand why things are the way they are, you need to understand that evolutionary history and you need to know something about evolutionary theory um, and evolutionary data. So one of the great questions, so this is a Sir Peter Medawar, um, but one of the great questions in biology in general is why do animals senesce and die? And Medawar's really very insightful solution was that, um, that organisms are under positive selection, they're under, under, under natural selection uh, when they're young and up till they mature and as they reproduce, but as they stop or they get close to the end of reproduction and stop reproducing, they enter what's called the selective shadow. And the selective shadow is when basically natural selection doesn't care about us anymore, right? If you're no longer, you have, after all, if all that natural selection cares about is how many offspring you have who survive and reproduce. Once you stop reproducing, you're basically no longer of any relevance to natural selection and you sort of fall off the screen, fall off the radar basically. And something's changed obviously in humans because in humans we've evolved not only to live long, but we've also lived, evolved to live long after we stop reproducing. So there's something special about human beings. And this has raised a really interesting puzzle in human life history. So if you're a monkey, right, typical sort of <clears throat> uh, primate monkey, right, you, you've kind of finished growing your brain uh, when you're about, you know, a year, year and a half. You finish growing your body when you're about six years old, and you're lucky if you live to be about 20. Chimpanzees have slowed that down, right? Chimpanzees take about three years to grow their brain. They reach um, a sort of adult sort of stage and sort of sexual maturity when they're about 11 or 12. And in the wild, they very rarely live beyond 40. In zoos, they can live into their 60s, but that's extremely rare. Um, they, so let's, let's, let's cap them off at close to 50. But humans have done something extraordinary. Humans take about six years to grow our brains. We don't really finish growing our bodies until we're about 18. We have this long adult period up until about 50, and then we also have about two decades of post-reproductive life. And although a lot of people think that you know, life used to be sort of nasty, shortish, and brute in the, in the, in the Stone Age, that's actually not true. Um, actually, hunter-gatherers do have, um, in, until 600 generations ago, all human beings were hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers have pretty high levels of infant mortality, but if they survive the first few years of life, their modal age of death is, is between 68 and 78. So humans evolved to live about seven decades for the most part. Um, and, and they do so uh, without actually that many chronic diseases. Um, whereas I, as I mentioned before, chimpanzees rarely survive uh, past the age of 40. So what's going on in humans? Why do we have such this long lifespan? But also most importantly, why do we have this long post-reproductive uh, lifespan? And there's been a number of good explanations and they're all kind of variations on the same thing, which is that when humans age, we don't simply um, enter the shadow of, of, of selection as, uh, as uh, uh, Medawar called it. We actually stay relevant because we're transferring something from, from one generation to the next. And one of course important kind of transfer is, is energy, it's food. So the grandmother hypothesis, which some of you may have heard of, um, it should also be the grandfather hypothesis too, because grandfathers aren't irrelevant. But the grandmother hypothesis is that grandparents um, are actually are, are um, you know, produce a, actually a surplus of food, which they supply to their children and their grandchildren, and so they become relevant. They're by by doing that uh, hunting and gathering, they're they're actually promoting their 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 uh, uh, reproductive success uh, through their children and their grandchildren. The embodied capital hypothesis is kind of an elaboration of that which points out that grandparents not, don't just uh, provide food, but they also provide information and wisdom and knowledge and other sorts of, of, of transfers that also improve 
um, 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 the, the fitness of their, of their children and then the grandchildren, thereby increasing their reproductive success. Now there's a lot to talk about there. So I'm gonna zero in on one aspect of, of this hypothesis, which I'm, I call the active grandparent hypothesis. And that is that um, humans evolved extended lifespans and hence health spans, um, excuse, uh, excuse me, they evolved extended health spans, hence lifespans, because prior to modern medicine, health span and lifespan were basically the same thing, not just to be physically active, but also because of physical activity. In other words, I would make the case that healthy longevity is both a cause and an effect of physical activity. And there are really sort of three sub hypotheses that, um, that we can use to sort of test this idea. The first is that humans evolved to be more physically active than our ape uh, ancestors. The second is that we evolved to remain physically active as we age. And finally, that there was selection for physical activity to promote health span, health, hence lifespan. Because remember, we have to think about a pre, an era pre-medicine. So let's start with the first hypothesis. That's kind of the easiest one, which is that humans evolved to be more physically active than other apes. And there's lots of ways to, to study this and to, to, to evaluate this. I'm just gonna go for the very simplest one, but of course there's lots more data, which is, um, which is to use what's called the physical activity level. It's just a very sort of simple way of looking at how active an organism or a species is. And it's your, and your physical activity level is your, is your total energy expenditure, your daily en energy expenditure, the total amount of energy you spend in a given day doing absolutely everything, divided by your basal metal metabolic rate, which of course is the energy that you spend just to take care of the basic functions of your body. So if you're basically in a, in a hospital bed and thermoneutral conditions, you know, you know, not spending energy digesting food, et cetera, that amount of energy is your basal metabolic rate. And for most animals, physical activity levels are around three. Um, but uh, it turns out that primates in general and apes in particular were selected to be very um, inactive. They're essentially, we evolved essentially from couch potatoes. So orangs, chimps, gorillas all have physical activity levels of about 1.5 or low or less, which is really, really very low uh, for, most, for most animals, about 50% lower than, than most mammals. And at some point in human evolution, there was selection for humans to up that level relative to our ape cousins, because we actually evolved from a creature that was very much like a chimpanzee. So we're about 25% more active than chimpanzees. So hunter gatherers and pastoralists and subsistence farmers, pretty much everybody who doesn't live in a modern industrial environment most of those folks have physical activity levels about 1.8, 1.92. I'm, I'm being a little bit, um, a little bit um, uh, cautious here in terms of 1.8, 1.9, but uh, I would say actually two is probably a more likely value, but I, you know, let's err on the side of, of less rather than more. And so this means that, turns out that even sedentary humans are more physically active than wild chimpanzees. I love this little factoid. So this is a, this is a graph from from, uh, from my, my book, but this is a measure of total active energy expenditure in a day for, for hunter-gatherers from Tanzania, a group of people called the Hadza. I'll show you some more data from them, them later on. Uh, average Westerners from, from, uh, from the United States versus, versus uh, chimpanzees. And you can see that uh, just total energy expenditure of, of uh, even, even sedentary Westerners is greater than, than chimpanzees. Of course, if you wanna compare for, for body size, the best comparison for body size is fat-free body mass. So if you actually look at active energy expenditure relative to fat-free body mass, it still turns out that average Westerners are still more physically active in terms of how much energy they're spending per day, you know, per, cal per kilogram uh, of moving their body around, just doing stuff. So we're a pretty active species. Okay, so I think that's, uh, that's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that we evolved to, be, uh, to remain physically active as we age. Um, so it turns out that chimpanzees don't walk very much. That's one of the reasons why that they have those low physical activity levels I just showed you. Typical chimpanzee walks maybe two, three kilometers a day. I think the maximum that anybody's ever recorded a chimpanzee walking was about 10 kilometers. And apparently, according to my colleague, because I'm in a department full of people who study chimpanzees, the, the next day they're just bushed. They're like, they just sit around lolling around, completely incapable of doing almost anything, right? So, so that's just walking like six miles, right? Um, typical Westerners, uh, so this is data from around the world. This is actually data from a, from a wonderful paper that came out of Stanford, so based on cell phone data, but typical Westerners, um, uh, and I'm gonna have averaged men and women, um, are still more, at, do, do more traveling um, than chimpanzees. And you can see there's a decline in how much people walk per day. And this is a group of hunter-gatherers uh, in Tanzania called the Hadza, which I've had the pleasure of visiting. And some of my, my students have actually put, um, uh, former students have put, um, uh, accelerometers and heart rate monitors on them and GPSs on them. And we have a, a reasonable idea how they do this. So this is an average of men and women. 
Women, it turns out, walk about, um, about uh, nine, 10 kilometers a day. Men walk on average about 15 kilometers a day. And yes, there is a decline as they age, but they're, even, even as they're getting to their 60s, 70s, and there even have a few individuals who are older, they're still walking on average about seven kilometers a day, a little bit less for women and a little bit more for men. So they're staying very active as they age. Here's another way of showing the same uh, similar kind of data. We don't have heart rate monitor data from wild chimpanzees. You can imagine that would be a little bit challenging to put a heart rate monitor a, on a wild chimp, but we do have um, accelerometry data from the big NHANES data set compared to um, accelerometry and heart rate data from, from the Hadza. Again, this is this uh, hunter-gatherer population in Tanzania. And you can see, and this is the regression, there's actually, of course, scatter around the regression, but um, Hadza men and women are still pretty active every day. They're engaging in, um, you know, even by the time they're in their 60s or 70s and 80s, they're still engaging in well more than 150 minutes a day uh, of physical uh, activity. So uh, there are declines with age, but they still remain uh, quite, quite, quite active. And finally, um, what are they actually doing? Well, they're, they're working, right? So we have this idea in the West that when you get older and you retire, you know, you can move to Florida or Mallorca or wherever it is you want to go to, kick your feet up and kind of, you know, relax. But that's absolutely not the case what happens in, 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 in the kinds of populations that I work with, the subsistence farmers and hunter-gatherers. This is a graph uh, from, from, uh, uh, from the Hadza, again, just kind of show you the same population so you have some continuity. But this is how many minutes per day women spend foraging. So these are uh, pre-reproductive uh, women. These are mothers, uh, so reproductive age women, and these are grandmothers. And you can see that grandmothers are actually spending more time a day foraging actually than mothers. And of course, what they're doing is they're creating a surplus and they're providing that surplus um, to their offspring. And this is a graph that kind of shows that. So this is a, a data, this is not my data. This is a fantastic uh, paper from, uh, from Hilliard Kaplan et al from 2000. But uh, what, what you're seeing here in a yellow line is ch chimpanzee production and consumption, which of course is the same, right? Chimpanzees get the food that they eat. So they're, they produce and consume the exact same amount of food. And you can see that chimpanzee is up there around 1600 calories a day. Um, this, and in, in blue, this is for females on the left and for males on the, on the right, but the, but the consumption is in the dashed line and the production is in the solid line. And you can see that mothers, up until they're about the age of 40, 45, they're actually in energy deficit. They're actually using more energy than they're actually able to hunt and gather, right? Well, they're not hunting very much, but they're gathering, right? So they need to make up that deficit. And the way they make that deficit up is of course that grandmothers are producing a surplus. So they, grandmothers can, can, can put some of that surplus to their, to their daughters and their granddaughters, but also men are producing a surplus because men are getting really high calorie food. Men often get honey and they get, get, get meat and they produce sometimes you know, several thousand calories a day of surplus, which then they supply to, 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 to females and to, their, and to offspring which then makes up for this deficit. So this is critical to the hunting gathering way of life. This is how all of us lived until recently. And you can't make the system work unless people are, remain active as they stay old to transfer energy from one generation to the next. Okay, and then the final hypothesis is that there was selection in human beings for physical activity to promote health span, hence also lifespan. And, uh, and, and I'm not gonna talk again so much about mechanisms because I know Tom is gonna be talk coming up soon and he'll talk about mechanisms. So I kind of, I can sort of cheat a little bit, but I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna talk more about, about evolutionary mechanisms rather than, than, than sort of processes, okay? And I'm gonna talk about two. The first are energetic trade-offs and the second is, is investment in, in repair and maintenance. And basically the argument I'm gonna make is that there are three kinds of trade-offs going on. If you think about life, Life is basically, you know, to reduce it very simplistically, we're here on this planet to take in energy and turn that into babies, right? Energy in, babies out. That's the equation of life. I'm sorry to be so reductionist, but from, the, from an evolutionary perspective, that's really, that's all about, right? And when you take in energy, you can spend it on only five things, right? Because energy until, like time, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a limited, um, is a limited resource, right? Until, until Time is still a limited resource. So the, the time you're spending right now listening to me is time you're not spending doing something else. And until recently, energy was a limited resource for all human beings. So energy they spend on one thing is energy they don't spend on another thing. So the, that means you have to have trade-offs, right? So you can spend energy growing. You can spend energy maintaining your body. You can spend energy storing fat, which of course is a two-way street because you can also get that energy back. You spend energy on reproduction, which of course is the only thing natural selection actually cares about. 
And you can spend that energy on physical activity, which is you know getting food or avoiding being somebody else's food or, or having fun, right? So let's talk about three trade-offs. The first being trading off phys uh, between physical activity and these other factors. We're, we're gonna ignore growth right now. So the first is that physical activity diverts energy from reproduction, right? If you spend, a, like this morning, I went for about a five mile run, I spent about 500 calories. If I were trying to reproduce, that's 500 calories that I would not be spending on reproduction, right? If I was an energy limited. Of course, that's more important for females than males because females are, are using energy differently than males for reproduction. And so we know this from multiple, multiple studies. This is a very famous study uh, done here by my colleague, Peter Ellison. So I'm gonna use that one, to be very parochial here. But this is a very this is a study done right here. I can actually see the Charles River from my from my from my window here. But this is a study that was done of women in Boston running along the Charles River. These were not these were healthy young uh, 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 women. Um, they were running only about 20 kilometers a week, which is about 180 calories a day of physical activity. And you can see here uh, these are salivary progesterone levels. And you can see that during the luteal phase of of men's, of, of the cycle, their progesterone levels were about 50 percent lower. Uh, than those of completely sedentary but healthy women, right? And this has been replicated many times. We also know this is true of it for estrogen. And of course, it's hormones that are mediating energy balance and, and energy and media, mediating how, how you use energy in your body. And since, of course, you know, being physically active was a normal thing in human evolution, um, it's really the sedentary women who have an abnormally high uh, level of, 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 of progesterone as well as estrogen. And of course, that has important effects on health because we know that physical inactivity increases reproductive re investment, because after all, that's what we're doing, we're shunting energy is, you know, life is energy in, babies out. So when you're not spending energy on physical activity, you naturally gonna, nat natural selection is gonna want to shunt more energy towards reproduction. But in this modern environment of energy abundance, that leads to a mismatch where you get really high levels of, um, of, uh, of reproductive hormones, which of course are mitotic. And there's a strong association between uh, um, uh, le leisure time physical activity and the risk of breast cancer tumors that are both estrogen and progesterone re receptive. So, for example, women who are who are walking about an hour a day have a you know roughly 55% reduction in their lifetime risk of, of breast cancer. And there are quite a few studies which have have you know come up with sort of similar results. Okay, so the second trade-off is one that I think many people appreciate without too much difficulty, which is that uh, when you spend energy on physical activity, that's also energy you can't uh, divert towards storage. There's, of course, lots of data on this. There's a bit of debate about just how much physical activity is useful for losing weight, but certainly not being physically active is important, is, is, a, is a well known risk factor for gaining weight. Uh, here's one very simple study that was done uh, in, in Copenhagen by, um, by, uh, by Bente Peterson and colleagues, but they took a bunch of young, active men. I think there were 10 individuals in the study. I should have put more data on, uh, on the slide here. Um, and uh, these, were, these were people who averaged about uh, 10,000 steps a day. They reduced them to about 1,500 steps a day, but otherwise kept them uh, um, uh, uh, on isocaloric diets, et cetera. And over those two weeks, they increased their visceral fat deposits by 7%. And then there also be all kinds of you know, signals of, of, uh, of metabolic syndrome are on the rise in terms of plasma triglycerides and, 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 and insulin levels and you know, glucose color tolerance tests, et cetera. Here's the resource. You can check it out yourself, right? So, uh, and this leads of course to a kind of a double whammy, a kind of an interaction effect, because when you are physically inactive and you gain weight, of course you can end up getting in, inflam inflammation. So adipocytes as they swell become inflammatory, as we well know, and inflammation, chronic inflammation is, is, a, is a kind of a, a part of the uh, sort of the, uh, the etiology of a, num of a number of chronic diseases. But there's also a kind of the, another effect, which is that skeletal muscle is really important in producing uh, cytokines, actually what we call them myokines because they're produced by muscle, that are, play a really major role in suppressing inflammation. And therefore, uh, both of these, uh, these factors interact uh, to uh, increase your risk of Alzheimer's and atherosclerosis and diabetes and all the other kinds of um, uh, diseases, chronic diseases of aging that, did, that used to be extremely rare but have become increasingly common. And then finally, I think the, the trade-off that may be the most interesting, and maybe we can spend more time talking about this later on, but I know since Tom is gonna to be talking about it, I'm gonna give this short shrift, but, um, but physical activity, of course, is stressful, right? Um, when you exercise, you're doing all kinds of stresses on your body, right? You're, 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 you know, you're, if I go for a run this morning, I'm creating tiny little bits of micro damage in my bones and my muscles. There's hemodynamic stress and you know, stress in my heart and my 
joints are having to deal with the loading and there's damage to my epithelia and I'm producing all kinds of reactive oxygen species and that's causing damage to my DNA and there's protein denaturation and I'm producing all kinds of metabolites like lactic acid and I'm using up my phosphagens and activating my central, my, my sympathetic nervous system and I could go on and on and on. This is just a list of these various kinds of stresses. But obviously natural selection because we've always been active and our ancestors and other species are active, has evolved all kinds of mechanisms uh, for, for physical activity to, to stimulate repair and maintenance, right? So, so when I go for a run in the morning, I also produce all kinds of antioxidants like superoxide dismutase, which I produce in abundance. And I produce IL-6, which at high levels is actually an anti-inflammatory and turns on IL-1A and all kinds of other anti-inflammatory myokines. And I, and I engage in all kinds of, turn all kinds of mechanisms that are involved in cell repair and DNA repair and mitochondrial repair and, and, and so on. I produce BDNFs for my brain. I mean, the list is really, really, really long and there's a long and interesting uh, a set of, sort of uh, uh, responses, but these are responses to physical activity. And the, and the key thing is that until recently, nobody was physically inactive. It wasn't possible to be a, you know, a couch potato in the, in the Stone Age. So we never evolved to turn these mechanisms on to the same extent when we weren't physically active. And we can get some estimate about how much they are um, from what's called the, uh, the post-exercise oxygen consumption. It's all more colloquially known as an afterburn. So if you go, if you're in the morning, you have a resting energy expenditure, that's your sort of basal metabolism. You go for a run, you spend some energy, but afterwards it takes a while for your resting energy ex expenditure, for your metabolism to go back down to zero. In fact, sometimes it can take as much as 48 hours. And only about 10 to 20% of that is actually replacement of, of, of oxygen and, and phosphates, right? So it's called a, it used to be called an oxygen debt, but we no longer call it an oxygen debt because oxygen doesn't actually account for most of this debt, right? And so as you're getting older, right? And you can keep being physically active, you're gonna end up investing, as we can guess from this graph, more energy in, being in, re, in, in, in repair and maintenance. And over time, that's gonna of course help your functional capacity. And we can even come up with some, some very kind of, this is a kind of a back of the envelope, envelope calculation but if you're as active as a, as a typical Hadza hunter-gatherer, again, I'm using the same population kind of for continuity, but we have data that the Hadza spend about 135 minutes a day. This is by the way, a picture that I took following some Hadza women when they're, when they're off uh, 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 gathering. I can tell you they walk at a good clip. It's keeping up with them is not so easy. And we know, we can guess, we can know from various ex experiments that, um, that that means that they're spending about 42 to 98 calories a day on excess post-exercise oxygen consumption which depending upon your model accounts for between about three to 5% of the resting energy expenditure or put into very blunt terms, it's about, about the amount of energy you would expend running between five and 14 marathons a year. Of course, this is again, all back of the envelope calculations. And so the result is that as we get older, exercise is increasingly salubrious, right? And we've known this for a long time. And I just wanna remind everybody, if you don't know this famous study, it's always worth re reminding ourselves of it. This is, the, this is the Harvard alumni study um, obviously a little bit parochial here, but, um, uh, but pa started by Ralph Paffenbarger, who of course ended up at Stanford. Um, and he, he figured out that uh, universities are a fantastic place to study this sort of uh, problem because uh, the universities never let go of their alumni and they're always keeping track and asking us for money. And so he convinced the Harvard Alumni Association and the development office to let him keep track of also alumni health um, and, uh, and activity. And what he showed was that alums who were, uh, reasonably active, so about 2000 calories a week of, of exercise, when they were in their you know, less than 50, those who were exercising a lot had about 21% lower all-cause uh, death rates. Um, in their 50s, of course, there's a 36% reduction from that same amount of physical activity, but by the time you get into your 70s and 80s, there's a 50% reduction. And I think, and I think that, uh, this is, the, the explanation really lies uh, in this evolutionary history. And so to conclude, I would argue that although there are all kinds of important, interesting pathways, we never will have any kind of an exercise pill because there's no, there's no one pathway that we can, um, we can ever identify and try to uh, interfere with that has as many effects as well as, uh, as many stresses and as many responses as good old fashioned exercise, right? It's, there's, it's just, this is just a pipe dream, right? And so, um, so I think that the, the, the unambiguous impl implication is that, is that as we continue to, to, to explore ways to, to promote healthy aging, our primary focus must remain to promote physical activity, especially among older individuals. So in the United States today, average 60-year-olds uh, are, are physically active half as much as average 20-year-olds 
um, which is not saying a huge amount because average 20 year olds old are averaging about 24 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day. And that declines to about 12. And yet we know from, this is data from well over a million Americans, right? This is the relative risk of death against minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity that 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity results in a 50% in a reduction. So, um, so with that, um, uh, I hope I've given you a kind of a, some ideas about why uh, exercise is so important for health and, um, and, uh, and just to say thank you and look forward to questions later on. Thank you so much. That was fabulous, Dan. And I think we'll hold our questions till the end. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Rando who can go into some of the basic science of why exercise is beneficial. Okay, thank you, Joan. And thank you, Dan, that, that was fantastic. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, just a, pretty much a 30,000 foot view of some aspects of, of aging. And I'll circle back to the obviously the main topic of the today's session on exercise. Uh, but interestingly, a lot of things Dan talked about will, will be reflected in things that I'll talk about today. So yeah, so I'll talk about exercise as a so-called geroprotective and, and Dan obviously introduced this idea. And toward the end, I'll, I'll get into this idea that at least some of the benefits of exercise may be mediated by, by the effects of exercise on stem cells in the body, which is something that we study. So these are my disclosures and you know, no, no conflicts with my talk today. Um, but let me start with just the, the, the bigger picture of aging. So aging is you know, clearly something that we easily recognize, but actually find hard to define um, in, in terms of molecular processes, physiologic processes. I mean, basically what we know, what we would all say is there's some element of decline in structure and function that is the prototypic characteristic of aging. Um, so even though we, we, we can't define it so well, we certainly are interested in, to find out if there's anything that we can do about it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about kind of in interventions that are very high level um, that have become of interest in the fields of aging and GR science and are clearly of interest to the general public uh, in terms of what we can do to potentially slow arrest and maybe even reverse um, aspects of, of aging. And, and this ranges from things like drugs to diet and, and obviously to exercise. Um, so let me just begin with, with a couple of, of, of famous drugs that you've probably heard of that have been studied in this context. And, and one is, of course, the drug metformin. And, and many of you will have heard of this. It's a very common diabetes drug. And it's from a class of compounds that were originally um, found in the French lilac um, and used really in, in folk medicine for, for several centuries. Um, and it's quite effective in, um, in treating diabetes. In studies of the, the pathways that are affected by this drug, there became an interest in how this kind of generally shifts metabolism and um, investigators began to look at this in terms of how it affected aging in the kinds of animals that we study in the aging field, which include um, worms and flies and, and, and mice and so forth. And it was found that, that treating these animals with metformin could actually extend their lifespan. And, and that became kind of almost a, you know, this kind of prototype of asking if it extends lifespan, might it actually extend health span in humans is where the field has evolved. But a lot of this has really evolved around looking at lifespan extension. But there was a, a key paper that was published now uh, many years ago, um, quite a few years ago from the UK, looking at the effects of metformin on survival in, in humans. And these are what I call, what you see below here, what I call the kind of survival curve or Kaplan-Meier curve, where you start off with a group of people, all of them are alive, and then you, you, know, you follow them and, and some of them begin to die. And that's how this curve falls off here. Now, these are something 70 year old people. And so you see over this time course of several years, people begin to die. And these curves here, the black curve and the red curve are, are healthy people as they begin to die. In the blue line here are, are patients with diabetes being treated with, with a, different, a different drug. And as you can see, their, their risk of dying is, is higher. More people die over a shorter period of time. But what was really interesting and really surprising is that this green line here are patients with diabetes, but treated with metformin. So this is striking because not only does this drug reduce the risk of patients with diabetes from, di from dying, but it actually looks as if, small study, that they actually survive better than patients without diabetes. Okay, so this really, from a human epidemiologic standpoint, really raised the question of whether 
this kind of drug might be actually slowing the aging process in addition to treating diabetes in a way that might be good for everybody <laughs> in a general sense. So, so that was the, the concept and, and that idea is out there that there may be drugs that can actually slow the aging process and that might be beneficial to the population at large or at least a, a group of people that could actually be given to people before they develop diseases and that could actually extend their lifespan by, by preventing the onset of, of age-related diseases. And this drug metformin is actually being considered by the FDA now for a clinical trial that will be in a sense, the first of its kind. That is a drug that actually is being used to treat aging itself, not a specific disease, but treating people and looking for the ability of this drug to delay the onset of these age-related diseases. Okay, so this is, a, this is a paradigm shift and, and it's an, a big issue for the FDA appropriately so. Um, as to whether we should be developing drugs that are not for specific diseases, but are actually for this process that we're very interested in studying, this process of, of aging itself. Um, so this, you know, this, this trial is underway and designed, and, and we'll find out more about it. So the next dr drug I want to mention is, is rapamycin. And of course, this is a drug that um, Joan knows very well. She studied it for many years. And likewise, this is a drug that was found for an another reason. It was found on Easter Island, a Chilean island, uh, so-called Rapa Nui. And that's where the name rapamycin came from. And it was found initially to be basically an antibiotic, I think, I think an antifungal actually. And, um, but then it was found to have very strong immunosuppressive properties as well. And now it's used commonly, for example, in organ transplants um, and other, uh, other treatments that, that involve some kind of uh, adjunct immunosuppression. Well, in the same way, this drug started to be understood in terms of the, um, the, the proteins that it interacts with in the cell. And it became very of interest as to how this drug rapamycin actually interacts with cellular metabolism as well. And in the same way, um, investigators started to study this in model organisms. And I think the first evidence of this drug as being kind of a lifespan extension actually was in, in yeast, and but then in other uh, model organisms and, and flies and worms and had quite a potent um, activity in terms of extending lifespan. So, so that's again, another important kind of avenue looking at drugs that might be used in this way as um, modulators and perhaps slowers of aging. But probably the, you know, the, the granddaddy intervention for slowing aging is, is caloric restriction. So withholding calories. And this has been around and known since the 1930s. And here's another a graph of kind of a lifespan curve. This is in mice. And so here again, all the mice are alive. In, in the green, you see the control mice, they begin to die about half of them are still alive around 30 months of age. Well, if you restrict the calories by 25% or massively 55% or 65%, you see the animals live longer and longer and longer, and almost a doubling of lifespan um, by this really massive caloric restriction in these mice. So this has been replicated in, in lots of species, many, many species. Um, there's strong evidence that this occurs in primates even, that you can actually delay the onset of death delay the onset of age-related diseases by restricting calories. And if you're so inclined, you can join the Caloric Restriction Society and you can restrict your calories and you can be hungry for a very long time. And if you don't get hit by a bus, maybe you'll live longer. We, we don't know in humans yet, there's certainly evidence from studies of fasting and, and other dietary interventions that there is likely to be an effect in humans, but we don't have any actual lifespan studies. So, so we came into this this field of interventions for affecting aging in a kind of roundabout way. And it, we came into this really from our studies of, of stem cells and tissue repair. And our, our interest came, we were originally just interested in how tissues repair and the stem cells in the body that repair them. Uh, but we came interested in the question of why do we lose a lot of this reparative capacity as we get older? So in a younger human, if you injure a tissue, a skin or a bone, they heal very, very well, very, very quickly and with very little scar formation. But, but as we get older, we all know this, that our, our wounds, our, our injuries um, heal more slowly, often with a lot of scarring. And we know that this is not due per se because we run out of stem cells. We, we still have plenty of stem cells, but we, the stem cells, and this is something we've studied in detail, begin to lose their efficacy in terms of tissue repair and tissue regeneration. So the tissue that we've studied primarily is skeletal muscle, and I'll just show some um, basically representation of how good muscle is at repairing itself. So just like skin. So on the top here, these are a microscopic view 
of a, of a muscle from a mouse. And then after a few days of a total necrotic injury to that tissue from a toxin, you see a destruction of that architecture. And after a few days, you start to see the formation of these newly forming kind of muscle, muscle fibers that over the course of a few weeks grow and restore that tissue. So really this remarkable regenerative capacity to, to basically go from a totally damaged tissue back to a normal tissue. Well, well, that capacity does decline with age and this is illustrated in this slide from some data from our lab uh, in the mouse. And this has been known um, before we did this, but we're just illustrating it here. So these are muscles from a young mouse or an old mouse. Here's the uninjured muscle. After a first injury, a second injury, you still get very, very good repair. But in the old animals, even after a single injury, you start to see these areas, these sort of whitish areas that are the beginning of, of scar tissue formation. Um, after a second injury, you see a lot more scar tissue for formation. And some of this blue area here is, is more inflammation. So just the, the, the ability to repair is something that we, that we see declines uh, with age. So we became very interested in asking, can we intervene in a way to restore this youthful re reparative capacity to old tissues and old animals? And we had evidence to, to support the idea that some of the enhanced repair in the young animal comes from positive reparative factors in the blood and some of the in, um, declining regenerative capacity with age came from um, suppressive activities in the blood. And this led us to do this very strange, but, but, but turning out to be a very important experiment uh, using this technique called parabiosis. And parabiosis is a technique whereby animals are surgically connected and they develop a single shared circulatory system. So the tissues of one animal are exposed to the circulating environment of the other animal. And these kind of control pairs are so-called isochronic, so same age, young animal to young animal, or old animal to old animal. But the interesting experiment are the so-called heterochronic parabiotic pairs, where a young animal is connected to an old animal. So these animals, again, develop this shared circulatory system. And the old animal, over a few weeks, begins to be exposed over and over to the environment, to the circulation of this young animal. And we ask the question, what effect does that exposure to this young blood have on this old animal by then looking at, for example, its muscle stem cells and its ability to respond to a muscle injury? So we did these experiments where we would introduce some, an injury into the, either the control pairs or these um, heterochronic pairs. And what we found was really quite striking. So in these control pairs, this is an early phase of regeneration. This is, take my word for it, very healthy regeneration. In the, in the old partners, young, old to old, we start to see a lot of this fibrosis that I mentioned, a lot of scarring. But in the old animal that had been connected to the young animal for some period of weeks, they repair just as well as the young animals. So, and we were able to find, we've done many more studies on this, that there's really a restoration of the stem cells that, that engage in this repair from an old state to a young state. So that we really seem to be reprogramming in a sense, these old cells to become younger. So it, it, is this truly rejuvenation? And that's, that's the kind of the million dollar question. And, and really from everything we study from a functional perspective to a molecular perspective, it appears as if these cells and tissues are in fact acquiring a more youthful state. So just by that definition, until we have a true molecular definition of cellular age, we, we're working on this. Um, this looks like a true rejuvenation. So moving cells and tissues back from an age state back to a younger state through a kind of reprogramming. So we published this in the early 2000s, looking at both muscle and liver, and then collaboratively with our colleague at Stanford, Tony West Corey, we started looking at the brain and nurse, neural stem cells. And then over the many next years, uh, many other tissues were, were examined in these heterochronic parabiotic pairs and found to show restoration of youthful function in the spinal cord, the pancreas, the heart, brain vasculature, et cetera, et cetera. So many, many tissues have been have been studied and have been shown to have this rejuvenating effect by exposure to young blood. And of course, this doesn't escape the popular imagination. This is from a, um, a, a episode of called Blood Boy from, from Silicon Valley, the satirical HBO comedy in which this older entrepreneur is getting an infusion of blood from this, this young healthy male with the idea that this is going to help him live longer and, and healthier um, over time. But our question is, you know, are there more practical interventions? We're obviously not gonna be parabiotically pairing humans, 
um, that would restore youthful function to old cells. And this, this circles back to, the, again, the main topic of today, which is exercise. And Hippocrates had said, had written, um, eating alone will not keep a man well. He must also take exercise. Of course, Hippocrates, I guess, didn't know about caloric restriction. So he might have said eating less will not only keep a man well, but he must also exercise. But clearly, there, was, there has been this idea of the benefit of exercise to health and, and, and longevity uh, for, for, for centuries and millennia. So th this is just an article that I like from the New York Times, because um, I too, like Dan, I'm a runner, I run marathons. And according to the article, um, an hour of running may add seven hours to your life. So I like the math. So I guess if I just keep running, I can just basically get achieve what they call escape velocity and just keep running and running and running forever. I don't know if that will work, but I'm working on it. But this is a, this is a slide from a, um, an NIH program called MotorPack, which is the Molecular Transducers of Physical Activity, which asks this fundamental question that, that Dan raised and that, I'll, uh, that I am talking about, which is why does exercise do this? I mean, what, do we, what is it that happens when we exercise that reduces our susceptibility to all these diseases, whether it's lung cancer or diabetes, um, heart attack, you know, cardiovascular disease, bone health, muscle health, brain health. I mean, all of these are well known, but we really have little idea at this point on what the real molecular transducers are of physical activities. And, and this is actually, Dan referred to this, so this idea that muscle does not only um, move our body, move our joints, but it's actually a secretory organ. So muscle secretes things, and it secretes things locally, and it secretes things into the blood, these so-called myokines that, that Dan mentioned, that are these positive regulators of metabolism, but they have positive effects on fat, on liver, on, on pancreas, on bone. Um, and so the question really is, are these myokines, are what's secreted by muscle, are these the mediators? And the more we exercise, the more positive things are secreted um, from our muscle, both locally and then into our blood um, that might be mediating these beneficial effects. So I wanna just talk about how um, the evidence we have that, that these might be acting on stem cells. And some of the first evidence of this actually came from uh, Rusty Gage's lab at the Salk Institute, in which they, they found that exercise, just in the form of, of wheel running, had this profound effect on stem cells in the brain, so-called neural stem cells, leading to so-called enhanced neurogenesis, the forming of, formation of new neurons. And these are um, neural stem cells in the area of the brain that are important for learning and memory. And it was clear that, that exercise can stimulate these um, neural stem cells and this enhancement of, of, of learning and memory as perhaps one of the most profound things you can do to enhance um, brain stimulation and neurogenesis. So a few years ago, we asked the question, does exercise actually rejuvenate old muscle stem cells? Um, so the way we did this experiment is we put mice on one of these running wheels and we exercised them for a few weeks. And then we, again, looked at their muscle injury responses. And this is work done by a former MD PhD student in the lab, Jimmy Brett, and a current postdoc in the lab, Marina Arjona. And what we found was really quite striking. So again, mice run, for, run on a running wheel for three weeks, and then we injure the muscle. And we measure on the y-axis here is just an index of the regeneration. So how, how well the muscles regenerate in young versus old mice. What was interesting is we then had some mice not exercise and some mice exercise. Exercise had very little effect on the young mice in terms of this muscle regeneration. But in the old mice, which have an impaired regeneration compared to young, exercise almost restored uh, this regeneration back to a young level. So in a way, similar to what we saw um, with the parabiotic experiments. So clearly exercise was having this, this impact on this repair. And we looked at actually at the muscle stem cells and we asked, what are the genes that are turned on in these old stem cells in response to exercise? And this is just a complicated plot looking at lots and lots of genes. But what you see high up here, the, the gene that was the most highly induced in response to exercise is this gene, cyclin D1, which is a very famous gene in terms of regulating cell proliferation and so-called cell cycle. So we ended up doing a lot of experiments, which I won't go into, in which we either reduced the levels of cyclin D1, and we showed that that impaired the ability of exercise to enhance muscle repair. So clearly this gene, its, its induction is important for this exercise response. And equally importantly, if we maintain cyclin D1 levels high in old muscle stem cells, we could enhance the repair of muscle in the old animals. So clearly cyclin D1 is playing a, a pivotal role in the stem cell population and in response to exercise. 
So this is just our, our kind of working model of how, how this looks. So here you have young mice and old mice, and we look at their muscle stem cells um, from, the, from these hind limb muscles, cycling D1 levels go down with age, and with that decline, you see an impairment of this regenerative response. But with exercise, you can induce, even in the old animals, this cycling D1 back up to a more youthful level and, and you can get important improved regeneration. So what we don't know is if this is the same pathway that works in other stem cells, but um, this is what we're interested in studying and how this is regulated. And again, if there are factors in the blood um, that can be identified that can lead to this response, um, they could potentially be turned in some, some kind of therapeutic, not, not the exercise pill, as Dan said, but at least therapeutics that could potentially enhance different aspects of, of stem cell function that change with age. So I'm just gonna end with, with two more interesting pieces of, of data from these studies. And the first is something that will be familiar to anyone who trains and then stops training. And that is the effect of exercise is transient. Um, we run these mice on a wheel for three weeks. And again, we're looking here at kind of a stem cell function. Um, immediately after three weeks of exercise, that function is improved. Then of course, of one week, two weeks, as we all know, that benefit declines. And so once you stop training, you know that your, your, your fitness goes down fairly quickly and, and goes back down to baseline. So, so that's no surprise, but the, the molecular pathways and the, the cellular path, pathways kind of parallel what we know has happened, happened physiologically. And then the, the last piece of data I wanna share is if we took old mice and we transfused them with blood, either from another old mouse that had not exercised or from an old mouse that had exercised, we asked what does the effect of those plasma transfers have on stem cell function. And what we found, this is just shown here on the graph on the right, is that the effects of transfer of plasma from non-exercised mice is much less compared to the exercised mice. So this just says that there actually is something in the blood of mice that exercise that can be transferred by a blood transfusion into another animal to produce the benefit of that exercise just confirming or, or, or supporting the idea that there are factors in the blood that are mediating this beneficial effect that potentially could be identified and could potentially be um, translated into some kind of therapeutic. Okay, so let me just end by again talking about this idea of aging as a, this is the fountain of youth, of course, and um, can it be um, reversible? Can it be reversed? Is aging reversible? We know that aging is malleable in the sense that we can slow aging, we can delay the processes that change. Uh, but from this kind of data, as well as other data from other kinds of experiments, there's increasing interest in the idea that at least aspects of the aging of cells and tissues can be reversed at least, at least transiently. And I think from a point of view of, of therapeutics, one can really imagine that being translated into tissue repair. So the time of a bone fracture or the time of a skin wound could you introduce some kind of therapeutic in this way that could restore youthful function to the older stem cells to enhance the repair, at least of that tissue during that time? So I, th I think that's, that's where we think of this beginning and then extending that more to longer term treatments in terms of um, delaying the onset of, of age related diseases. So th this is my group, the people who do all the work while I get to do all the talking. And we have great collaborators at Stanford and around the country. Of course, I'm very grateful for our support for this kind of research, uh, particularly from the National Institute on Aging and from the Glenn Foundation for Medical Research. So with that, I will stop and I'll um, stop sharing my screen and I'll turn this back over to Joan. Thank you, Tom. That was fabulous. Two wonderful talks, lots and lots of comments from the participants. And I think I'll start off looking at what everybody in the audience is talking about is what is exactly healthy amounts of exercise? You know, is it the aerobic? Is it weight training? Is it a combination? Does this amount of exercise and the types change as we get older? You know, as Dan, you mentioned, well, exercise is beneficial because it upregulates this stress response. But if you get older and you're less able to upregulate a stress response, should you be moderating your exercise? Like you should be, mon you know, weight loss is good when you're younger, but it actually isn't good at over age 65. So maybe both of you can talk about your thoughts on if we wanted to, both from an evolutionary and basic science perspective, 
use exercise to increase health span, what is it we should be doing? Well, I'm going to give a slightly contrarian response, um, just um, which is that I think part of the problem with exercise and the way we think about exercise is that we've medicalized it, you know, we prescribe it, we've commodified it, we've industrialized it, and and the result is that we treat it like you know, like a like a prescription, like a drug, right? You know, there's a certain we think there's like an optimal dose, and there's an optimal type, and. Uh, I don't think as an evolutionary biologist that that exists. And, um, and I think we need to be really careful about that because it depends on who you are, right? For, 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 first of all, you know, are you young? Are you old? Are you male? Are you female? Are you fit? Are you non-fit? And, and secondly, if you look at pretty much most of the dose response curves to exercise, it's not a U-shaped curve where there's an optimal amount, right? It turns out that some is better than none and more gets better and eventually it tails off. And actually there's precious little evidence that you can exercise too much. Um, and, and that's just based on very kind of general me measures of sort of total dose, you know, how much moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, in, terms of, in terms of amount, again, it gets very complicated. I mean, obviously some mix is good, um, but you know, efforts to try to kind of come up with an exact optimal ratio, um, are again, are gonna be confounded by all the variants in the system and by the various kinds of dose response curves. Again, you know, as you get older, certainly strength training becomes relatively more important um, to prevent sarcopenia, you know, muscle loss. Um, and and I, you know, Tom can talk more about this than I, but my understanding is that as you age, the ability of muscles to respond to, um, to loading can still, can still remain pretty potent. Um, uh, so, um, so I think, you know, um, I think for most people who struggle to get enough exercise, the simple answer is whatever you're willing to do, uh, because, because the vast majority of people aren't exercising at all. So rather, and, and I think it often becomes off-putting. So, you know, the reason I entitled my book Exercised with a, with a D at the end is that people are, are an, to be exercised means be, to be confused and anxious and concerned and ambivalent, right, about, and I think the way in which we treat exercise makes people exercised about exercise. And, and, and I think, you know, just helping being more, a little more compassionate and being a little less kind of prescriptive, I think we can, you know, do what you enjoy doing, and and I, you know, I mean, obviously there are, you know, there, we we can get to the weeds, but 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 maybe that's my somewhat um, contrarian view. Okay, and Tom. Yes, uh, I wouldn't. I would agree with all the contrarian points. I mean, I, I think that. So let me make a, a couple of points. One is that, you know, if you look at the the societies around the world, um, you know, Sardinia, Yokinawa, that have supposedly the longest lived people. Um, you know, on, on average, they have they do have the longest lived people. And you start and look, what do they do? Well, they don't exercise. But, but by when I say exercise, what I mean is they don't go to the gym. They don't do, they just are active. You know, they don't do something to exercise. They just are, that's their lifestyle. And so that's, to me, a, you know, an important take home message is that this, and I, you know, Dan referred to this in his talk, just a daily activity is what's important. And so I think, you know, for, for, for my reading of uh, the literature, again, agree with what Dan said, is that if you look at distance runners and you look at kind of reduction in, in mortality risk, it's only, you know, at the very, very high end, and that's a very small number of people and a very little data, that it might start to go up a little, like you can exercise too much. Other than that, it just goes down, 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 down. The more you exercise, the better. So I agree with what Dan said. And then again, I also agree with what Dan said. The, the thing about resistance exercise, the thing that we know the most about that is that it's important later in life because it really becomes important at, at points in people's lives where they lose the ability to do things like get up out of a chair, where, where suddenly lifestyle has a huge impact on mortality risk. If you can't get up out of a chair, you can't get out of bed. And so then having, had, having done resistance exercise to maintain muscle strength, it's less about this global thing that we've been talking about a reducing risk of disease, and it's more about muscle strength per se. And so, that's why as people age, there's, there really is this, this suggestion to combine both aerobic and resistive exercise. Um, I, maybe I can just add one more point to Tom's, um, which is that you know, we have data on muscle strength in aging po you know, non-Western populations um, because the, you know, the places that, like where I work in Kenya or in Tanzania or in Mexico, you know, people stay physically active their whole lives. Remember, there's a distinction between exercise and physical activity. Physical activity is just doing stuff. Exercise is discretionary, voluntary physical activity for the sake of health and fitness. It's a very modern, strange thing. 
But in these populations where people don't exercise, but they're physically active, they maintain, for example, we can measure grip strength. And as they stay into their 60s, 70s, and 80s, they maintain grip strengths, which in the West and places like the United States and the UK are about you know, 85th percentile strength, right? So um, that's average. So, but just by just like living, but they don't do crazy w workouts, right? Because um, remember, muscle is a really expensive tissue. And if you have excess muscle, you need a lot of excess calories to pay for that. So our ancestors were not super jacked kind of, you know, you know, ultra strong kind of, you know, bodybuilders, that would have actually been a, a de deleterious. Um, we're adapted to be kind of moderately strong, but being too strong is actually a, a, a cost for most of human evolution. What about the really um, intense interval training? I remember being at an aging meeting with a very good physical therapist who said, you can build mitochondria mass in your muscles in 10 minutes by doing, you know, 30, one minute of peak and nine minutes of moderate. Yeah, high, that intensity, doesn't yeah, high interval. intensity interval training. HIT. Very, very interesting and exciting kind of development. And, and, and the answer is that HIT is good, right? There's, a, there's, there's plenty of compelling evidence that high intensity, remember, it's cardio, it's not resistance. It's, a, it's just by, you know, it's just very high intensity cardio, basically. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's like an extra dose of stress, right? It's very stressful and it turns on responses. But there's also data which shows that, you know, you're not going to get, you know, super healthy just by doing HIT, you know, and that, kind of that makes sense, right? Um, um, uh, as with everything, you know, it's a mix, right? And, and uh, so a kind of mix of kind of moderate intensity carb cardio plus some degree of high intensity turns, again, because they're all turning on different responses and, and the end result is, uh, is, you know, that, that overall benefit. But, um, but Tom, you might have more. Tom, any thoughts on the biology going No, I mean, on the, the biology, I think, is clear. It's, as you say, there, there really is this remarkable increase in mitochondrial biogenesis and, and, and adaptation of the muscle to this high-intensity interval training. I mean, I, I think that the, the important point here is that nobody keeps up high-intensity interval training, that it's not a lifestyle um, option. People just don't keep doing it. So, you know, really from the point of view of public health and, and public well-being, it, it's far more important that we get people out of their chair and walking that they can do for the rest of their lives and, and, and develop a, a lifestyle that's less sedentary and more active. And HIT is not it. I mean, HIT is fine, you know, when you're on a, you know, it, it's January 1st and you decide you're going to, you know, New Year's resolution, you're going to do it for three weeks and then you'll never do it again. I think that, you know, that's, I think that's the key is, is that no one keeps that up. <laughs> Excellent. And then, Dan, I know you're leaving soon, and I want to give you some questions from the audience. Sure. And I, one of so them, I'm, my 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 colleagues are coming a little bit late, so I have a little extra time. Oh, but, good. Yeah. So one of the questions was in that Harvard study of the alumni. How do we know there wasn't a confounder that the people who exercise more, it was because they could exercise and the people exercising less was because they had underlying diseases. How do you? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, it's a, any kind of study like that is not a, you know, a controlled study. So um, on its own, no, but there's plenty of other, uh, there's plenty of other data um, that kind of confirm that um, with, um, you know, with, with also with, you know, careful, you know, statistical controls. I mean, the American, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the aerobic center longitudinal study. I mean, there are plenty of, of long-term studies that have shown um, the same effect. I just happened to just pick that one up because it was the first one. It was kind of historically kind of fun. Um, sure, um, there are, you know, there, there's the kind of a survivor bias always that you need to correct for, but we have statistical models that, that do a good job with correcting for that. Um, okay. It's not, it's not a, there, there's so many ways of answering this question. Um, it's not that you know people who are healthier end up exercising more. <laughs> if that right. were the case, uh, then we'd all be out of business. And I had a question on your evolutionary slide of you have the animals that have exercise a lot, and then you, but they don't have a very long lifespan. And then you have the chimps that are sedentary and have a longer lifespan. First of all, why? Do the chimps have a longer lifespan and why did they evolutionarily evolve to be sedentary when it's probably not a good trait? Well, 
I think there's actually, I think the evidence really is that humans have evolved to respond to the, to, 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 to the, to the, to the, 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 the salubrious benefits, the health benefits of exercise differently than from other animals. It turns out if you, if you exercise and Tom, Tom, I'm sure knows this literature better than I do, but you know, if you look into the literature on, on putting rats and mice on treadmills and getting them to exercise, um, their maximum lifespan um, doesn't really change very much, if not, if at all. That, that it's not actually a way to increase their lifespan. There are there are there are functional benefits, but they're not lifespan benefits. And and it turns out if you compare a zoo animal, so, so there's a study that was in Nature a few years ago that looked at I think it was I can't remember the exact numbers, but like 89 species or something like that. And they compared wild and zoo animals. And of course, zoo animals get veterinary care and they and they um, they get you know. Uh, but but they don't get all that physical activity, and you'd predict that wild animals um, would uh, would um, would actually that their maximum lifespan because they're more physically active, uh, their their maximum lifespan would be uh, as long if not longer, and that they would have lower rates of senescence. But it turns out that's not true for the vast majority of animals. Uh, zoo animals don't senesce more rapidly than uh, wild animals, and they actually have a longer lifespan. So so physical inactivity is not harming them. As much as it seems to harm humans. Now, that's, this is kind of hypothetical, but I've, that's one of the reasons why we need to be really careful when we're using model organisms. There's a lot to learn from model organisms, but I think we should focus more on the differences between model organisms and humans always than, than just the similarities. And so, because, because humans may actually have been selected to, to respond to uh, physical activity in ways that are different from other organisms. Because again, if you're a, if you're a mouse and you only live a few years, right, and your job is to pump out babies as fast as possible. There's no selection for long lifespan, whereas chimpanzees um, have a much more what we call we call a, a K-selected species. They have a slow down life history. They have offspring every every about five or six years. So there's going to be selection for them to live longer, in, in regardless of their lifespan. And 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 then finally, to answer your question about why apes are so inactive, it's it's because apes don't need to be. Um, they live in a forest surrounded by fruit, um, but the fruit is highly fibrous. And, and one of the ways in which they manage to have their, their, to, to, have their uh, to use energy to have more babies is actually by saving energy so that they can use that energy in digestion um, and, um, um, and maybe plowing some of that into, into lifespan. But, um, but, uh, but chimpanzees or like gorillas live in like in a salad bowl. I mean, they don't have to go anywhere uh, to eat. Um, they just kind of reach out and put the branch in their mouth. Chimpanzees have to travel just a few kilometers a day to get all the food that they need. They, a chimpanzee spends 50% of its day just putting food in its mouth. And then it fills its belly with highly fibrous food, it has to empty it and then fills it again. I mean, that's basically life as a chimpanzee. Thank you, Joan. Can I, can I ask Dan a question? Sure. sure. So, so Dan, I, I just, as you were talking, I was wondering if there's any, it's a little bit off topic, but if there's any reason to believe that the evolution of a less active lifestyle is related to predation, meaning that it's safer to be you know, in the home or in the nest and, and not out hunting and gathering, and that somehow humans either had fewer predators or there are, I mean, is there any evidence of that? Not really. I mean, chimpanzees do uh, suffer from predation as well. Um, and then hominins, as soon as we became bipedal, because actually what set us off on another lineage from, from the apes was being bipedal. As soon as we, we became bipedal, we became slow and awkward. We became much more vulnerable to predation. And, um, and, and the reason we started traveling longer distances is because we moved to more open environments where we had to travel farther in order to get food. So, so I think it's actually, um, uh, so, so, so actually, no, I'm not, I'm not sure if I would, I would, I would buy that. It's an interesting sure. idea. So there's been some questions on frailty. And I think this for Tom is, you know, there's muscle repair and then there's sarcopenia. And what are your thoughts on what's contributing to the etiology of sarcopenia? Is it stem cell function? Is it something else? Will these parabiosis factors have any effect on that? And what can we do for frailty? So, so that's, a, that's a, a very good question, a very important question. So, so I did talk about this decline in muscle reparative activity with age, but, for, but clearly epidemiologically in humans, the mo more important functional decline with age is strength and, and, and that relates to loss of muscle mass. mass. Without a doubt, that is far, far more important. They are, there, there are some conflicting data, but I would say from my opinion that they're unrelated, meaning sarcopenia 
is something that occurs as a direct result of the biology of these large muscle fibers, independent of the stem cells in the tissue. And I would say there's precious little evidence that enhancing stem cell function will prevent sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is really a response of these large muscle fibers to their environment. So changing hormonal status, changing neural innervation, these kind of other things that are changing with age. And it really is the, the response of those muscle fibers to resistive training that leads to increase in muscle mass and muscle strength. And so, yes, there, there are almost certainly interventions that we can and should be doing specifically for sarcopenia, but they are probably unrelated to the biology that I talked about today, namely the ability of stem cells to repair a wound to the muscle. And so would, would that mean that resistance training might be the best intervention right now to delay or avoid sarcopenia? Absolutely. I mean, so as you can imagine, there's been a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical industry in developing drugs, as you know, Joan, to, you know, to, um, to prevent or ameliorate sarcopenia. You know, we, at this point, there really is no, um, there's no treatment for sarcopenia except for resistive exercise. And so that is absolutely, um, you know, the geriatrician's best tool as, as people begin to become frail, as they begin to lose muscle mass, is to engage in some forms of resistive exercise training to maintain muscle strength. And as Dan said, there, you know, it, it's clear that the response to resistive training declines with age, but there's also very good evidence that as we get older, we can still build muscle mass. And so um, that is probably the single best intervention. It is the single best intervention we have right now to prevent this you know, fairly devastating and, and, and in some ways life-threatening problem of sarcopenia. Can I, if I can just add one thing, is that sarcopenia is what we call a mismatch disease. So mismatch diseases are diseases that arise because our, we're, we're sort of inadequately or imperfectly adapted to novel environments. And, and one of the hallmarks of mismatch diseases is that they're, they're present in sort of modern post-industrial societies where, we, where we've changed our diets and physical activity, but we don't see evidence for, for sarcopenia in, 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 in these non-industrial populations. It just doesn't exist. We don't, just as we, we almost never see type two diabetes and heart diseases is, is close to non-existent if, if actually non-existent in many of these populations. These are, these are diseases caused, uh, you know, we often talk about diseases of aging as if aging causes the disease. They're, 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 they occur as we get older, but age is not the cause of the disease. The cause of the disease is the environmental change that, that interacts with changes as we age, but they're not caused by aging. And, and I think that's an important ev uh, distinction that uh, so evolutionary science can help us uh, re remind us. So the Hasda don't get sarcopenia? Nope. Jo so no, what do they, they die from? Either. They don't get hypertensive. I mean, we publish data, you know, hypertension is another example of a disease that, you know, we, you know, doctors in medical school, like they learn, uh, you know, students in medical school learn that hypertension, you know, people get hypertensive as they get older, but we have, population after population after population, you know, in the, in, we studied the Native American populations in Mexico, there's data on the Hadza, the data on the, in the Kalahari, on the Bushmen, et cetera, that, that those populations don't become hypertensive as they get older. Um, this, is a, this is a modern Western phenomenon. What do they die from? They die from infectious diseases. Uh, they die from, from respiratory diseases. They die from malaria, uh, but, uh, but they're not dying from heart disease. We don't have much data on cancer, but but, but it looks pretty clear that cancers are much, much lower. So you know, the two major causes of disease in the West, cancer and heart disease are, are, are you know, certainly heart disease is, is basically non-existent and cancers are, are probably very, very rare. Metabolic diseases don't exist. Um, again, this is not like there's like nirvana and everything's like wonderful, right? There are other problems and there are other causes, but they're not the kinds of chronic diseases that are, that are, uh, that are causing morbidity and mortality in the West. And Joan, if I could just add something to that too. I mean, you know, I mentioned in passing this idea of caloric restriction. That somehow, you know, if we if we restrict calories, um, we we live longer and we live healthier, and, and that certainly seems to be true. And it seems to be true, you know, in lots of animals su such as mice. But, you know, we're restricting calories from mice that are being fed all day long, and 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 humans, you know, we whenever we want. And so, you know, the kind of paradox there is that it may not be that caloric restriction is good for you. It's the diets we eat that are bad for us. Yeah. You know, the, the, the nature, the, the natural state is to be a little bit hungry. You know, the, the abnormal state is to be in a zoo or a laboratory 
or, or in a human society where food is, is, is plentiful. And so, you know, it's the same kind of flip side. It's like, is what we're doing experimentally improving on kind of an evolutionary selection or are we just basically going back to where we have been selected for evolutionary to be? And, and that may be to be partially calorically restricted, if not, if not to have long periods of fasting. So Got it. I, can I, I, I can't resist jumping on this <laughs> topic, um, but caloric restriction, of course, is talked about all the time. There have been, apart from the mice models, there's two major primate studies of caloric restriction. One was done in Wisconsin and one was done at NIH. The first one was the Wisconsin study, which got all the attention, but, but the, the caloric restriction study in the Wisconsin study compared calorically restricted uh, macaques against macaques fed a really obesogenic diet. Um, and a lot of those macaques who weren't calorically restricted were actually getting diabetes and, and various other kinds of uh, chronic diseases. The experiment was replicated at vast expense by NIH. But the NIH experiment then compared true caloric restriction against macaques spelled, fed, fed a, just a kind of a normal healthy diet. And there they found no evidence for caloric restriction extending um, life or having much benefit on health. So I think that the, the evidence for, for humans is, is, as Tom was saying, it's really not so much the caloric restriction relative to a normal diet. It's, it's, it's just having a normal diet relative to the calorically superabundant calorie, you know, sugar rich, fat rich diet that, that we, we are able to have. That's really the problem. Back, and, and there was one question on genetics, which I'd like you both to answer, but also back to the cause of death in the HASD, and there's some questions about this. Are they dying from infectious disease at the same rate as younger adults? So it's just over time, or are there diseases whose incidence is increasing over time to suggest areas where exercise maybe doesn't have a benefit? So it's, I don't think the data are good enough to, to answer the question at that degree of, of granularity. Um, we know that in, uh, infant mortality rates are very high from, from diarrhea um, and other kinds of infectious diseases that children are especially prone to. And that was true of human, humans until very recently, right? until, until modern medicine. Um, so there's a, there's a rapid, rapid uh, infant mortality rate and then it kind of tails off. Um, and, then, and then mortality kind of ticks along at a kind of constant rate from malaria uh, respiratory diseases like tuberculosis. Unfortunately, there's HIV in the area, uh, diseases like that. Interestingly enough, diseases like respiratory tract infections seem to not be a major, um, um, a major cause of, 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 of disease in most of these populations because they live at such low population densities um, that there's really not the kind of uh, herd necessary for those diseases to spread from person to person. So most of the diseases are zoonoses that they get. And furthermore, um, we also know that, um, and we're actually learning this from COVID, that physical activity is also actually very protective or helps or partially protective against respiratory tract infections. When you exercise, you upregulate you know, natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. You redeploy those cells primarily to the, um, to the, um, to the respiratory tract. It actually uh, upregulates uh, uh, the adaptive immune system in various ways. So, um, so, so yeah, that, and of course there's death from violence. Um, there's death from, from animals, um, there's a variety of kinds of deaths we don't see in our in our in the United States, but um, um, but they're not dying from the kinds of chronic diseases um, that um, that are the major cause of, of of morbidity and mortality in in places like the United States. And Tom, do you want to take on the role of genetics in what <laughs> you mean? In like in Bennett, like for people who are is there a genetic component to benefits from exercise that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very, so I, I, I'm not an expert in that. So I, I, I probably um, don't have uh, a lot to say, but, I, but let me make a comment about genetics and, and, and diet and aging, which, you know, I, I tend to think of diet and exercise, just like your parents told you, those are the two things you should do. And it's still true. You know, we spent billions and billions on studying this and it's still diet and exercise are mo the most important things you can probably do for your own health and lifespan. Um, but in terms of genetics, so, so again, back to caloric restriction, there are a couple of studies that were done um, that, were, that looked at genetically different mice subjected to the same amount of caloric restriction. This is being repeated, so um, you know, we may learn more, but the, the conclusions of those two independent studies was they took some number, 50, 60 different recombinant and red strains of mice, so genetically distinct mice, 
subjected them to the same form of caloric restriction, half lived longer and half lived shorter. So that to me just speaks to exactly what you're asking, Joan, is we're, and, and what Dan said about kind of an exercise pill. You know, we're probably really looking at personalized kind of precision interventions here, both in terms of diet and exercise, and that it will depend a lot on your genetics and on your lifestyle in terms of what is beneficial to you versus what could be harmful. I mean, clearly dietary restriction for someone who is overweight is important for their health. Dietary restriction for someone who's extremely lean is, is probably moving them on the, on the wrong side of the curve. And it may be, although like I said, you know, like both Dan and I said, we don't have any data that I'm aware of that there are genetic predisposition, predispositions to susceptibility to exercise in a negative way. I, I don't know that, but probably there will be clear genetic predispositions to responses to exercise. I don't know, Dan, do you know anything about, about this? Um, no, I don't think we have good, good and there's certainly data on genetic, genetic, you know, genetic um, predispositions in response to performance and exercise, but I don't think we have the good, good enough data on health because the outcomes are so hard to measure, right? So you can measure, mm -hmm. You can, and it turns out that most of the genes that seem to, it's, they're very just polygenic systems with, you know, like height, you know, they're gonna be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of genes. They're go, most gonna be genes of small effect. Um, and they're gonna be, there's gonna be all kinds of epistasis and all kinds of other kind of interesting interactions. Um, and, um, and, um, and it's gonna make it a real challenge. Um, so yes, there is, there's, a, there's no question there are genetic bases to a lot of these things, but it's gonna be really, really, really hard to unravel them. And it's, I mean, when I look at the literature, most of the time, the best conclusions that people seem to come up with is that, you know, there's a kind of lower heritabilities for your survivorship up to about 80, and then heritabilities rise after about the age of 80, but, the, but, but you know, attempts to try to find those genes through GWAS, et cetera, have been really frustrating. And, and frustrating to the point that uh, it's, you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, and it's probably not one needle, it's actually a lot of very in, complexly interconnected needles that are, it's not gonna be an easy, challenge to, to, to unravel. We also have some questions on, these are just excellent questions from the audience. The effect of exercise on telomeres and the effect of exercise on the microbiome and the interactions between these and the benefits of exercise. Well, Tom's got to answer the telomere question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I'm trying to think of even I mean, anecdotal data. Uh, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, to the extent that telomere length is important for longevity is a major question. So even if exercise does have an effect, um, I would consider that not to be an important health or, or longevity effect. But I don't know studies that have looked specifically at telomere length, even in muscle. Um, you know, which, which telomere length and muscle should be relatively stable because the tissue does not turn over a lot. I, I just don't know what's been done. It's something I, I'll have to look up after this. Yeah, I, I agree with what you just said. I mean, there's, you know, tel telomere length probably has more to do with, maybe better, better associated with cancer than probably much anything else, but not so much with longevity. I think there are some studies which show that exercise does affect telomerase a little bit. Um, though I don't know quite how much of an effect it has on, on again, on longevity. So I think you need to be, a little bit cautious about that. What was the other question I'm trying to- I've Microbiome, already... is there oh, any- well, oh, That's a growing field. And there's a lot of really exciting data on that. I mean, we do know that physical activity does affect um, the relative, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, the environment of the microbiome. And it turns out to actually, um, there's a really fun study that was done actually right across the, the street here in George Church's lab, where they showed that uh, physical activity actually upregulates, and I've forgotten the phylum of bacteria that's important for this, but it actually, uh, actually helps produce more short chain fatty acids from, from, um, from uh, oligosaccharides that you can then use um, in, 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 um, in physical activity. So there's, 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 there's no question there's evidence that uh, physical activity does affect the microbiome. It affects also the, the integrity of the gut because of course there's, um, you know, there's leaky gut syndrome and there's stresses on acting on the gut. And so there's a, this is a growing field. There's a lot of, actually just down the hallway from my, from me, there are people in my department who are, who are, who are actually studying this very topic. So it's a, I would say, stay tuned, right? There's a lot of exciting information coming out, but I think it's a little too early to, to say much more than we know that there's some things going on. Joan, Tom, and Dan, I hate to intervene, but we're, we've reached the end of our publicized, uh, 
time for our webinar. This has been terrific, uh, and we want to thank the speakers and the audience. First of all, uh, this webcast will be posted on our Catalyst website, and the links will be sent to you automatically. Uh, if you've been registered for this, uh, you will get the, uh, the links within a, a day or uh, a business day or two, I think. Secondly, important if you do receive a survey, please do provide us with feedbacks on how to uh, improve our webinars. In fact, if anyone wants to enter rave reviews or scathing critiques of what went on today, uh, please feel to put it in the chat and uh, we'll, uh, we'll learn from that. Um, just a reminder, a last reminder for folks who are interested in entering the book giveaway to comment on your exercise regime, what you do, what obstacles you faced, how you've gotten over that. Um, and and uh, so formally speaking, I would uh, thank everyone and wish everyone a good day and a good weekend. Now, just to evoke in real life conferences, we're going to keep the Zoom line open for some minutes, 15, even 30 minutes. I know that some uh uh, Dan or others may have to leave, but uh, some of the most interesting interactions in our experience has been these sort of milling around after the speakers step off the virtual dais. So I'd welcome folks to maybe enter, uh, if you have comments or questions, uh, further questions, uh, if you could enter in the chat uh, a, a, a request to be recognized, maybe we can switch to sort of a radio call and talk show uh, format uh, by inviting folks to unmute themselves and we can have a, a chat until until we kind of run out of time. So with that, formally closing, the, thank you every, everybody and let's uh, see whether, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, is Zan on the line? I see Philip, there are folks here. Please uh, uh, don't be shy. Uh, raise your hands uh, with uh, in the chat and uh, we'll just and, and unmute yourself and let's start having a little bit of a conversation. The after party begins. Uh, I just wanted to mention, too, I wanted to thank everybody before they all leave. This has been an incredible group. I've been monitoring the uh, uh, the contest here. And we really have a book. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Why Walk with one of our collaborators, Free Walkers. Well, here we have Who Walks, uh, Who Exercises. And I think people are going to be very interested in this compendium we're going to put together just from this one conference. And that's how uh, easily you can contribute to a national dialogue, maybe a worldwide dialogue on exercise, just by giving us how, what you do, your barriers, what you can't do, as well as the potential of uh, winning the book. So thank you. You really did a great job. And take it away. Uh, let's create that salon that you love, Thomas. Anybody interested? I uh, see thanks. People are kind of going out of the room, but who, who can stay a little bit and chat with our uh, speakers? Tom, did you just, Tom Vasicek, did you just raise your hand? You're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Hello, I am James Wee. I'm a family practitioner in Chico, California. Uh, I have actually have a program that I uh, teach patients how to lose weight and exercise. Uh, and uh, if you look me up on the, uh, on the web, many patients have come has mentioned me. Uh, what I tell my patients about exercise is that every day that you exercise, you did not get one day older. Every day that you did not get exercise, you get one day older. The other thing about exercise is that I tell them that exercise does not help them lose weight, but exercise keep them young. And this is the amount of exercise I tell my patients. When you're 20 years old, you don't have to exercise and you're fine. When you're 30 years old, you have to spend half an hour exercising. When you're 40 years old, you have to spend an hour exercising. And when you're 50 years old, you have to spend an hour and a half. When you're 62 hours, when you're 72 and a half, when you're 83 hours, and when you're 90 or 100, you should spend four hours exercising. Now, I try to practice what I preach. The uh, amount of exercise I do is really meant to allow me to do my sports. I tell my patients that uh, to take up some sports. In the winter, I ski. Uh, now that I'm reaching my retirement age and I have a good nurse practitioner at my office, uh, in the uh, three or four months in winter, I work for one week and I ski for one week. I am right now at Lake Tahoe watching you on, uh, on my laptop. And uh, uh, so 
to maintain my muscle strength. And uh, it is very important from the lecture on the biology of muscles that uh, as you get older, you have to do more strength training exercise. Uh, I also tell my patients that uh, to pick up a sport that allows them to balance. And uh, skiing, skating, and many of these exercises uh, does allow you to balance. And balance is very important as you get older. And uh, to be able to enjoy or pick up some of these sports is very important. So I ski in winter and I play tennis in summer. Uh, it, uh, to maintain that uh, level of uh, fitness, to enjoy these sports at a certain level, uh, I try to jog on the treadmill at least two miles. And that takes me about half an hour to jog on the treadmill. I also have a wider machine and do some power lifting at least uh, twice a week. And uh, the other aerobic exercises I try to do is also bicycle or go on a ski machine, especially in the winter months. And I ask. I around about an hour and a half to two hours of exercises at my age. I am actually can, can I ask? Tom or Dan, how do you feel about this? The older you get, the more hours of exercise a day you need. And, 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 and before Tom and uh, I, I don't know if Dan's still there, great. Um, just a, a, a production note. Uh, for those who are not speaking, please mute yourself. We're hearing sort of slurping of a drink or something. So uh, when, when, when you're ready to speak, certainly unmute yourself. But uh, uh, please otherwise stay on mute. Go ahead, uh, Tom and Dan. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not aware of any data that would support that level of activity as people get older as being necessary. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think obviously it's very personal how much time, how much you want exercise. I, I just think that we should be encouraging people of every age to, to be active and physically, physically active, but um, I wouldn't prescribe any specific number of hours per day based on anything I know. Dan? I agree. Vociferously. I mean, look, we have to be really careful about this kind of medicalized, prescriptivized, you know, commercialized uh, approach to exercise. It's, uh, it's, uh, it actually does a lot of harm, I think. It, 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 it's off putting to people, it scares people. Uh, you know, most people are struggling to find, to, to exercise. And I think that the, the key lesson that we need to, to, to continue to remind folks, if you look at that graph, if you're sedentary, even even you know, 60 minutes a week, eight minutes a day has enormous benefits. Um, and if, if you're struggling to get started, um, to hear that you need to you know, do two hours a day on a treadmill or whatever it was, you know, that really scares people um, and it's off-putting. Um, and I think you know, if you're able to do that, all power to you, but there's no evidence that it's gonna has that much of an effect. So I think we need to be really, really thoughtful about the message that we give and, 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 um, and understand that, look, the fundamental thing about exercise is that it's abnormal, right? We, we evolved in conditions when we, where people had to be physically active, but they were in energy limited conditions and spending extra energy, you know, doing unnecessary physical activity that had no benefit, either social or, or, or in terms of getting food was actually a problem. And so now we're asking people to do something, to choose to do something in our modern world that's really abnormal. And, 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 and we're telling people that something is wrong with them, that they're lazy, right? Um, and, and that's just not true. We're asking, it's just like telling people that there's something wrong with them if they can't lose weight. Um, where that's also, we never evolved to lose weight. So we need to you know, be compassionate about, about the challenges that people face to, to choose to do unnecessary physical activity, which is essentially what exercise is. It's good for us, but it's also difficult. I was thinking there's a psych, a lot of this is psychology. You have to get people to want to exercise and that's the barrier. Is there things like, have, have people done, what are the things that help seniors get motivated to exercise? Is it group classes? Is it having a pet that you need to walk? Anybody done studies on this? Yeah, and the answer is when it's social, right? When it's fun, people, you know, a lot of the things that physical activities that people enjoy the most, they don't even think of as exercise, like dancing, right? Mm -hmm. you know? um, um, and, and, and when it's social, not only does you, you get a kind of a commitment contract where you have to, you know, you're like, your friends are expecting you, so you show up, right? Or you, you know, you, uh, you, uh, 
but also you get encouragement and you get feedback and it's you get to interact. I mean, Tom and I are both runners and I, Tom, if you're anything like me, you for a long run, I, the best thing to do is go with a bunch of friends and you yak and chat and talk about this, that and the other and the miles pass and you know it's so much easier and more enjoyable and 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 the people have been running together for for millions of years actually that's how they did it two million years ago and uh, um, I, so 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 the answer is yeah the data show that it's basically making it fun and making it social which is the same thing you know so, so i'll just add to that I, I see giselle has her hand up in another part so we'll, let's maybe get yes. to them next um but i'll just make one comment and that is uh, i mean what you say joan is you know it, is the challenge so you know dan mentions having social activities and that that's you know that is a great answer it's just not everybody has access to that and really this comes down to you know to the psychology of decision making and, and this is this is true for why we quit smoking why we go on diets why we exercise why we save money for retirement i mean everything that we do that we know is good for us but we don't do comes down to the psychology of decision making and so i think that's way beyond the exercise field. It's why do, why do humans not do things that they know are good for them, you know, and invest now for later. And it's just, I, I think it, it, it's, very, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. It's not, the point is it's not easy. Somehow we're not built to do th to, to make those kinds of decisions, to, to save money now for retirement. And, you know, we don't get people to do that, to stop smoking. And these are things that everybody knows is the right thing to do and they don't and exercise is in that bucket. And I think you know the more we learn about the psychology of how people make decisions and how do we intervene, it's at that level I think that, that globally, you know, nationally, is where that that question right you know um, sits. Excellent. And Joan, I just want to make a little bit of a pitch. At the Catalis Institute, we're very clear that we want health span for all. So any behaviors, any behavioral science, anything that we suggest are going to be something that's really inexpensive that people can actually go out and do uh, at any level. And, uh, we're, uh, and that's why it's free walkers and other groups ever walk that we're associated with so that it's a very inexpensive thing you can do. And we did do a study on it for a blog. And one of the motivators is vanity. If you exercise, you just look better. So that's <laughs> what it helps. There you go. That, never underestimate that as a motivator. So I want to and get I think it's Giselle and Aisha who maybe we'll do Giselle and then Aisha's question. If you can unmute. Can't hear you. I, oh, Giselle, I think you're still muted. We can't hear you. Mute. Thank oh, you. there you go. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Giselle Wertheim Ames. I'm the owner of a website called Longevity Live. Um, came out of a, a brand actually that was launched in the, the US about 34 years ago called Longevity. Um, I have a question, Dan. Um, very interested with the, hum the Hamza tribe around hormones, specifically as people mature and as we know, hormones start shifting. Very interested to find out whether there are any studies because obviously they're not on any form of medication, no HRT, no identical hormones, and whether you studied that at all and whether um Thomas you've also looked at that and the role maybe that that hormones play in conjunction with aging and then exercise and whether exercise has any influence over hormones I'd be most interested to hear thank you um there's some data on 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 sort of hormones and aging in in non-western populations it's not I'm not an endocrinologist so I'm not um uh, so we know that in general, uh, uh, T levels for men uh, tend to be lower uh, um, than in the West, um, um, which is actually a, a benefit. <laughs> um, um, and, and, but there's not enough good data on, on, um, on other reproductive hormone levels um, in women because uh, it's just hard to collect some of those data. So those, those data are, because you have to tie it to the menstrual cycle. Uh, so, so those data are a little harder to get, and so, um, so people are struggling to get those data. Um, there are data um, on levels of things, you know, cortisol, insulin. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of hormones out there to study. Um, they tend to have, you know, as you might expect, they have a, they have a low, low carbohydrate, high physical activity diet. They tend to have low levels of, of, of insulin um, relative to, you know, typical Americans. Um, cort baseline cortisol levels 
tend to be pretty pretty low in the in the healthy range. But you know, in the, and for the most part, you know, metabolically, they're they're just basically very healthy people. Thank you. Sorry, Aisha, did you have a question? I excuse me. I, I do have a question or a comment. I think when we come to the terms of aging, we also have to define whether it's uh, chronological aging or biological aging. Look at the two examples we have that both of them lift to, to a ripe old age, Jack LaLanne and George Burns. Now, comment on the, the uh, idea of biological aging and uh, chronological aging. Obviously, George Burns chronologically aged, but uh, Jack LaLanne did not chronologically age. Uh, he, biologically, he is very healthy up to 95 years old. I think you're making a distinction between senescence and aging, right? And aging is, you know, age, age is chronological, right? If you're 100, you're 100, whether you're healthy or not. Um, but uh, but the, the ability to maintain health you know, overall or, or on a cellular level, I mean, that varies from individual to individual based on a whole suite of issues. Diet being one of them, stress, psychosocial stress being another, exercise being another. That is where I think, but, but uh, if we're fully reductionistic, um, then we get into trouble. That's where I think exercise makes a big difference uh, in terms of your biological age and your chronological age. Let's move on to another question. Maybe. Yes. Well, I had I had a question. Um, actually, it's really two. One of my dearest friends got tinnitus um, or tinnitus, and he was standing under a very loud custodial alarm that rang at his job, and he has bilateral tinnitus ringing, you know, high pitched squealing in his ears. He, I know he's been to a million audiologists, you know, otolaryngologists, and they just say, take Xanax, or they just say, listen to sounds at night or a pillow, or I'm just wondering, because you know so much about biology and the aging process and cells, tell me, is there any way to like rectify what happened to him and, and fix those cells? So, that's outside my, my, my wheelhouse, but um, so, so the answer is, and I know a little bit about this just because my, you know, my day job, I'm a neurologist, but um, you know, the, the, there is no cure for tinnitus. I mean, you know, that, that we know, you know, basically people develop this and it does to develop more, you know, as we get older and, you know, whether it's, so there's nothing that I know of in terms of the biology that we talked about today that would, that would have an impact on that. So let me just say that, you know, th there is in just in terms of, you know, hearing, there are changes that occur in the, the hearing apparatus and there are, you know, they, they don't regenerate very well, but there's a lot of interest in stem cells for hearing loss and maybe for tinnitus. But, you know, again, I think that's nothing that I know of relates to, related to kind of exercise or physical activity or diet or anything we talked about today that I know of would potentially reverse that condition, but. Okay, but it's nice to know that there's some research going on with stem cells or something to, to perhaps repair it. And my other quick question was, um, I have a dear friend from college who had mono and now she has Epstein-Barr and she says it's like lifelong. And I know she loves exercise and wants to, but she's exhausted all the time and it just, you know, it flares up. Is there anything, biologically, is there anything to help her? So um, again, it's a li little bit uh, peripheral because what your friend is experiencing is, is what we call fatigue. Now fatigue is, is a very real experience of the individual, but it's not weakness. And I mean, it, generally those are two very different things. And you know, all the kinds of beneficial effects of health we, of, by exercise that we talked about today are independent of this issue of fatigue and people who feel fatigue who have that sense, um, their, their muscles are not weak. It's not, a, it's not measured biologically or biomechanically like we measure strength and, and endurance. And so that's, it's a quite, quite a different symptom and you know, unfortunately not benefited by the kinds of interventions um, that we, we talked about today. Okay, okay, she's still looking. So yeah, if there yes. are any interventions and anyone knows, feel free to help. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I see a question from Patricia, which is, could you ask Dr. Lieberman how his findings apply to non-ambulatory individuals? 
Um, I mean, well, look, first of all, I, I'm studying the evolution in, uh, of exercise. Um, so I don't, um, I don't study uh, people who are um, uh, that, that, that topic particularly, but I do know some of the literature. And of course, there's a lot of data that people who are, who are non-ambulatory, um, um, it's you know, f finding ways to help them um, to be physically active uh, is really important and has huge benefits. There's a lot of data on this. So you know, it's, a, it's, a large, it's a large field of trying to have, finding ways to help people with various kinds of disabilities um, to, to be physically active, whether it's swimming or, or you know, other ways that, that they, can, they can get their heart rate up and do physical activity and do strength training and other. So yeah, this is, this is really important. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a large field on this, but it's not my expertise. I'm, I'm afraid I have to go. My, my, my colleague is here and I'm about to do an experiment. So I'm, I'm oh, sorry to have thanks to so much, Jan, Thanks so much for your joining us today. And right. maybe we could do- well, Thank you. Maybe we can do one last question, um, which for Tom, can any diseases of old age be reversed by exercise and diet? So basically the, 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 the field of research has really been about the prevention or delay of diseases, um, of these diseases. And you know, can the diseases of aging be reversed? So, so if we think about the individuals individually, there's no evidence that I'm aware of, for example, that neurodegenerative diseases can be reversed by diet or exercise, but there's correlative evidence that a lifetime of exercise can delay the onset. And I would say that, yeah, I, I won't go so far as to say I, I can think through all the diseases of aging and say that that's, um, that that applies to all of them. I mean, for example, cardiovascular disease, you know, is it possible to have a restoration of a more healthy vasculature by exercise? You know, I think the answer to that is probably yes, um, but that's going to be on a, on a case by case, uh, on a disease by disease basis. Um, by far, the, the evidence that has been accumulated and, and the, the focus of the research is on um, exercise and diet as preventive therapies, not, not as curative therapies or reversive therapies. Terrific. Well, Thomas, I think we, is that, I actually have to move on to another call. I'll have to go very, very, yes. sure. Yeah. Should we call it so, a day? Terrific. Sure, thank you so much, Joan, Tom, uh, and uh, Bill, uh, thanks also to Dan who's uh, left now, but uh, really uh, it was a terrific webinar. Audience participation was terrific. We will definitely follow up. We'll uh, be copying and pasting the chat transcript and we'll follow up separately uh, to the extent we can. Uh, I think these interactive uh, communications and the idea exchanges are, are, are great. Um, I don't know, Zan, I don't know if you're still uh, able to speak, but I don't know whether you have a, you want to have a last word here, uh, but uh, don't I agree? Let's release you and Tom. It's great. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank yeah, thanks so much, Joan. You. you were terrific. And thanks to Tom and Dan and for Thomas for organizing this great production. Not only was it a terrific scientific discussion, there were just more aha moments than any webinar I can remember. So congratulations to everybody for that. Thanks very much. Have Thanks a great everyone. weekend, Have a everybody. Great show weekend. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.